Good morning. <laughs> How many of you have been here for all of these presentations? Show of hands. A few. How many of you is this your first time to be at one of these presentations? Oh, a couple of folks. Okay. Some of what I covered this morning may have been covered previously in another presentation. We're working basically from this book, Call to Community, The Life Jesus Wants for His People. So, community. What's community? If we look in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 20, we read, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, Jesus said, there I am in the midst of them. So when you've got two or three people gathered together, that's community. And when they're gathered together in Jesus' name, that's Christian community. So I'm here today to talk about irritation in community. I'm not real sure how I drew that card, but it's mine, so I'll deal with it. Irritation is defined to irritate is to provoke impatience or anger or displeasure or just to annoy. As we go through this this morning, I dare say some of you will think of someone somewhere along the way that has irritated you or annoyed you or caused you displeasure. Synonyms, I found 19 of them, folks. <clears throat> they are as follows. Annoyance, infuriation, <sighs> exasperation, vexation. What does vexation look like? I don't know that one. Indignation, <clears throat> impatience, crossness, displeasure, Resentment. What does resentment look like? I'm not sure. Gall. I have no idea what gall looks like. Somebody help me with that. Gall. Gall is... Mm, I don't know. How about chagrin? Peak? What's peak? I'm peaked at you. So there. Anger, rage, fury, wrath, outrage, temper, aggravation. Mm. Or just irritation. Think about your life story. Who, when, and how have you been irritated over the years? First, we start with community. What's community? Who's in the community? Well, family's a community. Brothers, sisters, in-laws, outlaws, and every family has a few outlaws, outliers out there that when everybody else talks about them, they go, you know, Uncle Larry. <clears throat> Anybody's named Larry in here, that's not about you. Family, friend, teammates. How many of you have ever been on a team? Football, baseball, twirlers, cheerleaders, been in a band, some kind of group. It's a community. Remember when you used to go on those bus trips in high school in the band or in the football team or basketball or baseball? That was community gathered together. Hmm. Co-workers, another community. How about groups, clubs, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, Eagle Scouts, Girl Scouts, book club, Bible study, prayer group. A couple of those would hopefully fall under a Christian community with God or Jesus in their midst. So that's the who of community in your lives. And then think about some time that you may have been irritated. Angry. Enraged. And you know, it may have been 30 years ago and it's still that little what do you call it, a burr under your saddle kind of deal? Every now and then when you think about it, you just sort of grind your teeth. You know, yeah, I see a face or two out there, they're going, yeah, and it was old so-and-so. <clears throat> I remember it, but I let go of it, sort of, maybe. I tried to.
Maybe it was one of the three B's. Maybe you were bullied. Maybe you were belittled. Or maybe you were betrayed. Or perhaps you felt abandoned or cheated. Sometimes the root of our irritation is because of differences. Sometimes I think we are irritated at people just because they're different from us. They don't walk like, talk like, dress like, think like, smell like I do. They're different. And I don't trust them. So I get irritated at them because they're different. You may have somebody in your life story that's that way. As you've been uh, going down memory lane as I have been sitting here talking, my guess is that some things have come to mind. And the next question is, okay, if you've thought about someone or something that has irritated you over the years, what are you going to do about it? Therapy is certainly an answer, and I've, I've done that in my life's journey, and that's helped. <clears throat> But for me, as a child of God and a minister of the gospel, my response of what to do with this irritation that I have in mind, my anger or my sense of outrage, what to do is to go back to God's Word. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but you do not notice the log in your own eye? So how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while there's a log in your own eye? And then the next sentence, Jesus is, I I see him, he's just almost shaking his finger as he says this, you hypocrite! First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. In this book, Call to Community, there's a lot of worthwhile advice. There's one particular quote in here by Anthony DeMello, and he says, Every time you find yourself irritated with someone, the one to look at is not the person, the other but yourself. And that's kind of what Jesus was saying. You've got to look in the mirror first. The question to ask is not what's wrong with this person, but rather what does this irritation tell me about myself? Now I take some candor and quite frankly some guts to do that, to go look in the mirror and say, okay, how is this about me? Maybe the reason that this particular action or behavior annoys me is because I have the same trait in my life. And I'm just that way to other people. It's a possibility worth thinking about. Or maybe the individual is not living up to the expectations that you have been programmed with in your family of origin. Again, they're not like me. They're different. Well, they were programmed differently than I was. God bless them. Or maybe, just maybe, that irritation, as DeMello says, is more about me and the way that I act and the way that I treat other people than it is about the focus of my irritation with that individual. So back to Jesus' advice. Look in the mirror first. First, I need to take the log out of my own eye. And then and only then am I in a position and a frame of mind to help my brother, my neighbor, my friend, anybody else that's part of my community. Only then can I help them deal with their stuff. i got to take care of my stuff first. And here's the key ingredient to the issue. If I don't deal with my own stuff, my own irritations, this thorn in my flesh, it will not 
listen to me, it will not magically disappear. It just doesn't happen. It just stays there. I love to work with wood. That's my therapy. I make sawdust. and The larger the pile of sawdust, the better I feel at the end of the day. And I've worked with knives and all kinds of implements to carve things and make things of wood over the years. And every now and then, I have an accident. <clears throat> Many years ago, I was working on a wood project and I had an accident. And folks, I got a, a splinter in this hand that was the mother of all splinters. And it was bleeding and I, you know, one of these, and I go into the house and I get the magnifying glass. I've done this before. <clears throat> and the tweezers and the alcohol, and I pour some alcohol on it, and I've got the magnifying glass, and I'm fiddling around, and finally I got that thing out and threw it away, and I bandaged my hand up. And How many of you know what happened? <laughs> I didn't get it all! <laughs> and it healed up over it! I see, if that happened to you, uh huh? It will. It will heal over it, but then it gets kind of pussy after a while and it starts to move in there and it hurts. And you know what you got to do? I had to go to the doctor and he had to give me a shot and then he had to cut it open. And actually, it was this hand because there's the scar right there. <clears throat> if you don't deal with it, if you don't get rid of it, it just stays there and festers. And that's the way. Life is when someone has irritated us, particularly if they're close to us, family, friend. And if it's one of the three B's, you know, betrayal or belittle or what was the third one? Bullying, yeah. And it just sits there and churns in our soul. So, what to do with that. I think that we're called to take our hurt and our pain to God because the hurt, the pain, the irritation will not just magically disappear. Jesus said, take it out, get rid of it. And the answer is often found in an act of forgiveness, an act of love, an act of letting go, and maybe, just maybe, even a dash of repentance. So take your hurt, your pain, your irritation to the foot of the cross and let it go. My guess is that as I've been talking, some of you have come up with at least one, if not more, irritations in your life journey that you've been sitting on for a long time. A number of years ago, I had the privilege of going to spend some time with a very, very wise man. And he was a, a pastor, happened to be a Baptist, but loving man of God. And he had gotten into the field of working with people and doing therapy. And I shared with him some of my irritations in my life journey. And he said, well, Robert, what are you going to do with that? I said, John, I, I don't know, man. I, I felt so betrayed. I was talking about one particular situation. I felt so betrayed, so incredibly wounded. Um, I'm still irritated about it today. I said something else and you fill in the blank, but I'm really still holding on to that today. And he said, well, Robert, when would now be a good time to let go of it? I said, what do you mean, when would now? He said, when would now be a good time to let go of it? And I said, well, I, now? He said, okay. I'm going to invite you to go on a little journey with me in prayer. I thought, okay. I'm a preacher. I'm a minister. I know about prayer. I've probably done this before, but I hadn't. I hadn't done that before. He said, I want you to close your eyes for a minute. And I want you to think about 
that situation. I want you to be there again. I said, but John, I opened my eyes. I said, but John, I don't want to go there again. It hurt. He said, I know it did. And when you get in touch with how much that hurt you, you'll get in touch with how much you need to be set free from that. Because it is a thorn in your soul. And so I close my eyes and tears are running down my cheeks. He said, I want you to, to see you, Robert, taking that person in that situation and holding them in your hands. Can you do that? And I said, blubbered through my tears. Yeah, I, I, I got it. He said, tell me about it. And I told him about it again. He said, now we're going to go someplace very, very special. And it's a beautiful place. We're going to go there in your mind. And so I'm holding on to this irritation, which had been a thorn in my flesh for so many years. And he invited me to go into this quiet, serene place, and it was a garden. And as he talked about it, I realized that I had been there once upon a time long ago on a trip to the Holy Land. He was talking about the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, see the place where Jesus knelt and prayed. And in my mind's eye, I saw that place. He said, I want you to kneel there. And I want to invite you to take that hurt, that pain, that irritation, and hold it up to God. Kind of like Jesus did when He said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And in my mind's eye, I knelt there praying and lifting up that situation, that irritation that had wounded me so many, many years before that I had carried for so long. It was in the background, you know, but every now and then it would rear its head. And then John said, what do you see? And I was actually kneeling by that point in time in his office. I said, uh, I see a cross on a hill. No, there are three crosses. He said, go on and describe it to me. And this, this was just my journey. I said, well, there's someone on the cross on the left and the cross on the right, but there's no one on the cross in the middle. He said, what else do you see? I said, well, there's some movement. And then I stopped because in my prayer dream vision, I could see Jesus walking in from stage left. His hands and His feet were wounded. And he came and he stood before me and he didn't say anything. And I just took that, that irritation, that situation, and I, I laid it at his feet. And as I let go of it, he reached down and grabbed my hands. And, and I felt a sense of, of love and acceptance and peace. And for me, over the years, I've learned that when I'm angry, when I'm irritated, when I'm frustrated, when I'm broken, when I'm hurt, for me, I go back to that place. 
And every time I do, I find that I experience a level of release and healing. And the interesting thing that I found is that it's still there, but it's there, not here. And as a footnote, Jesus never said it to me in the vision, but I sensed that I had permission to go back and pick it up if I wanted to, but I've never wanted to go back and pick any of them up again, folks. I just leave them there for eternity. What I want you to know is that God loves you and each and every one of you are precious in His sight. And I know you hear that, but I want you to experience that and feel that. Not just here, but here. And sometimes the way to do that is by letting go of those things that irritate us in life's journey. Those things that hold us back and hold us down. That can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus because they're toxic. They take away our love and our joy and our peace. I want to close this morning with one of my favorite pieces of Scripture. You probably are very familiar with it, many of you. The words of St. Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, if I have not love, I'm nothing. And then he goes on to say, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It's not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect, and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, and I read that as Jesus, when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. So faith, hope, love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Someday I will understand fully. What I can tell you is that as I have prayed that prayer over and over again with irritations in my life journey since I first did it that day with John and his office. I have experienced more and more of God's love, more of His grace. And I still see in a mirror dimly, but I see a whole lot more clearly today than I did when I was into holding on to those irritations in my life's journey. Let us pray. Father God, thank You. I thank You that You love each one of us and that we're created in Your image and we're precious in Your sight. And that Your desire for each of us is to be whole, to feel and experience Your love, and to be free from the burden of brokenness, hurt, pain, irritation, sin. Come Holy Spirit and touch each of us today. 
Touch those wounded places in our hearts and souls and minds where people have belittled, betrayed, wounded, abandoned, bullied, where others have hurt us. Touch us with your love and grace and set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all, and may God bless you.